Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. On this week's episode, I'm doing something pretty fun, something that is a very heavily requested video topic for some reason, and that's me sharing with you the builds that I'm the most proud of, that are my favorite. You might be surprised about some of them. You can probably guess some of them too. I'm curious if anyone out there can successfully guess, without cheating and fast forwarding, what my number one most favorite, most proud of build that I've ever done actually is. So. Put your guess in the comments below, but don't cheat, that's, that's no fun. Every single one of these does have a build video for it, and I will make a link in the video description that shares all of those, so you can check out these build videos, tutorials, whatever, if you miss them. So number 10, the modular wizard's tower. I really love this build. It's, in my opinion, the perfect bit of terrain for tabletop gamers, but it's also personally something I'm really proud of because as a content creator that's trying to share this with viewers, it hits all the marks that are most important and that's really hard to do. It's made out of cheap stuff. Anyone can do it with very little skill, uh, cheap materials. It looks good. It's super modular. You can make as many or as few as you want. And most importantly, it's playable. It's really practical and it, and it looks good. Usually you have to sacrifice one or more of those things. It's hard to get a design that encompasses all of them. And this one does it really, really well. This is less of a thing I'm proud of in terms of the actual build and more something I'm proud of in its design and its concept. It feels really good to bring something like this to my audience that you know I know a lot of people have actually made and uh, having a lot of fun with. Number nine. These little dumpsters. I really, really like these. I had a ton of fun building them and still, you know, year and a half, however long it's been later, I still look at them and they bring me a lot of joy and I'm really proud of them. They're a hundred percent scratch built, you know, out of paper and cardboard and little found objects. And, you know, I don't often work in modern styles. I don't often do stuff like this but I really, really enjoy it. I think I actually like it a lot more than doing the fantasy stuff. It's kind of nice to be constrained, you know, by trying to make something that actually looks like a thing that exists rather than having the excuse of, oh, it's just fantasy, I'll make whatever I want. And I was really proud of how these turned out considering they're essentially just made of paper. I love the little stickers on them. I like the graffiti and they're really, again, I love things that don't feel fragile that actually feel like gaming pieces that I don't have to worry about. And these are that really durable, look cool, sturdy. I absolutely love them. Number eight, the shipwreck cottage. It's a very neat and interesting piece. It's one of the things that gets a lot of people's attention if they come in my room and they look at all the stuff. This one often stands out because it's such a bizarre building and it's not something you usually see. I think it's a great idea, great concept. The uh, rough idea for it was a challenge sent to me by a Patreon supporter. And I'm really proud of how I actually accomplished this and made it work. And I used it in my campaign to great success. And it just looks really cool. It also has a lot of really neat little details on it that, you know, I kind of scratch built like the horns and the seal skin overhang and the little flower boxes. And I just, I really like it. It has a lot of character. It's painted pretty well, considering it's sort of a delicate building. It's, you know, it's again, pretty, pretty durable, pretty hard, loving that mob hodge, you know, making things stiff and the wood looks fantastic on it. I really like the foam wood grain the colors, all the staining. It looks like it's been sitting on a shore. And really it looks like something that exists in a fantasy world. Love it. Number seven. My hell brute. Now this isn't 100% uh, scratch built. It's a really heavy kit bash, but there was a lot of original sculpting on it, a lot of mixing of parts. And I really like him. If you remember this video, I took a model for my Warhammer army that I really disliked. I'm not a fan of the, the model or the kit and I turned it into something I really enjoy. It was really satisfying to make. I think it really holds up really well. I think that if you, I you know, were to show this in any kind of playing situation, it would catch people's eyes and they would notice it and it would stand out. It's got some really nice features like the goopy water coming out of his, you know, pipe in his stomach, which alone, I, I love that little addition, putting that discharge pipe for him to, you know, 
ooze out his butt, like necrotic bile or whatever. And I'm really happy with them. The, the paint job is also something I'm really happy with, which isn't always the case for my miniatures, but when it's come to my uh, Death Guard army, overall, I'm really happy with how the paint job's coming out both on the demon creatures and on all of the armor and everything. I really like the rusty, grimy, gross specs. And yeah, this guy is, he's my buddy and I love him and uh, I'm super proud of him. Number six, my cyberpunk diorama. Um, <laughs> this is, this was a really special build for me. It was, I think only my second most, second only really involved kind of diorama and I had a lot of fun doing it. It's again, like the modern stuff, cyberpunk is a setting that I don't get to work in very much, but I really enjoy it because there's all these like little details that uh, these sort of modern or futuristic settings lend themselves to, you know, things like the little sewer grate, the sidewalk, the bollard, the vending machine, the lighting, the, the signs. And this was such a mix of techniques and things that I'd never done before. I mean, there was all the, you know, dioramic modeling stuff, but I think it was the first time that I really successfully used stencils that I made myself to airbrush on designs on the street. I came up with a like a lot of really neat ways to deal with modern things like the signs and the bollard. And I was really happy with these window decals that I designed myself and got printed and made a cavity for them to light up and we got light in it and it's just really, really cool. I think this was one of the first things that I built that made me kind of feel like a legitimate maker. Uh, sometimes making terrain for games, it seems like a practical effort. It's a tool that you're making for, you know, for a game or whatever, and not something that, you know, maybe the average person would consider really creative or really proper art. I don't, I don't know if this still qualifies for proper art. I, I mean, I personally, I think it does, but I'm sure that's debatable, but doing this, it felt different than making game terrain. I felt like a lot of my heroes that I have watched throughout the years, the guys from Weta Workshop, Adam Savage, and it made me feel like, Hey, maybe I, I, I have some ability and skill to contribute to something like that. And you know, even with the little things that I think could be better, I still look at it on the shelf and I'm still really proud of it. But before we go to the top five, let's talk about this week's sponsor. If you're watching my videos, chances are you're interested in learning new skills and trying your hand at different artistic ventures. While channels like mine are a great resource to explore, Skillshare itself offers much more structured, ad-free environments with classes led by experts to help you grow whatever hobby or creative venture you're passionate about. There's a lot of subjects being taught on there that are applicable to miniature hobbyists and even people world building and storytelling through tabletop RPGs. Lincoln Michaels class science fiction and fantasy creating unique and powerful worlds is a perfect example of a class that could be applied to those of us creating unique worlds for our friends and families to game in. At less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, it's a great investment for creative people looking to refine their art. Now, if you just want to give it a try and see what's all there for you, I got good news. The first 1000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Thank you Skillshare for supporting creative people like myself and my viewers. Number five, my Eldritch Horror. This was such a fun thing to make, an old cheap, discount bargain bin Star Wars toy that everybody hated and nobody wanted, hacked up, cut apart, and turned into something really, really unique. This was one of the first big projects that I really used an airbrush on to change my painting style. And you know what? It, again, was a really liberating experience that, you know, I really, really enjoyed and it really affected my future builds. There's something I'm, you know, noticing in a lot of these pieces that I'm picking. A lot of the things that I'm the most proud of aren't things that are 100% scratch built. They're things that use other resources, be it old toys, found objects, 3D printing, whatever. I like that kind of mixed media approach and I find it tends to give a much richer and more interesting finished project. I think a lot of people get, you know, stuck on thinking that something has to be 100% from scratch in order for it to be worthwhile or to be proud of. And I think that's ridiculous. You use what's in the world, what you can get your hands on to make something really cool. Even if you're just building a model kit and painting it. Besides, to truly make apple pie from scratch, you must first 
invent the universe. So and I don't believe in that whole 100% from scratch built thing. That's a, a, a fallacy. Anyways, this is a really neat thing. I love seeing it sit on my sh shelf. This was the project I made right before the world kind of exploded and we went into quarantine lockdowns and it was meant for a game with my D&D group, which I still haven't used it in because our game is still shut down until it's more, you know, responsible to actually get together and game. He's sitting waiting patiently and I really do hope that, you know, he's going to see the light of day on the gaming table and I'm pretty confident that when it comes down to planning my first session, it's going to be around this guy because it's been almost a year and I have just been waiting and waiting to drop him on the table and actually use him. I think he deserves to fulfill his gaming destiny. But yeah, I just like this little guy. Number four. Mando and the Child. This was my first diorama. This was the piece where I went from just doing, you know, gaming stuff in the odd miniature to actually doing a display piece diorama. And it was so incredibly exciting and fun to do. And now more than a year later, I still think it holds up. And I think it's better than some of the dioramas that I've done since. It, it really came together for me. And I'm just really happy with the way a lot of it turned out. Again, I used a lot of kind of more modeling techniques than terrain building, you know, like using grout and the airbrush and all the bits and the greebles and really delicate 3D printed parts like these little stormtrooper helmets that are hollow that I couldn't really use on terrain because it, it would just end up breaking. But to sit on a shelf, there, usually when I'm looking back on a piece or like when I just finish something, I look at it later, there's little things I wish I had done differently or that I could change about it. But this one, I look at it and it makes me smile every time. It's a real crowd pleaser. Uh, people see it, you know, a lot more people recognize this than recognize a lot of the other gaming stuff. It just brings me a lot of joy. I made it early on in the Mandalorian series. I can't remember what it was, but like maybe four episodes in, we didn't know what the planet was. We didn't know who the child was, anything. And I made it with that kind of raw excitement about Star Wars putting out a really awesome new universe and story. But I also made it with some hesitation that, you know, that story would fall apart and it would become terrible. Well, now two full seasons later and it's still fantastic and I still love it. And honestly, I would like to make another diorama for season two because I love the Mandalorian and I love this diorama. Okay, now we're getting into top three. Number three. my uh, bill diorama from falling down. This was one of those ones where I made around a sponsor's 3D printed printable miniature. I really love this. It's the only piece in my collection that doesn't live in this room with all the other builds. It actually lives in my office on a nice display shelf. It's a highly personal piece for me. I was doing a lot of stuff outside my comfort zone. It's a movie that I grew up really enjoying uh, and my perspective has changed on many times in my various points of life. And every time I watch it, you know, makes me a little bit more introspective and uh, I think I learned something about the world and myself and I enjoy changing my views on things. It's really important for personal growth. But at the end of the day, I still love the movie no matter what I believe it ends up representing or whatever. It always has an important message to tell and that message can change every time you watch it. And I made a tiny little 28 millimeter scale Coca-Cola can and replicated the scene from the cover pretty well. You know, got the little graffiti, everything. I'm very happy with the paint job on this miniature. It's actually kind of a challenging paint job, black and, and white and, you know, Caucasian flesh. 100% satisfied and proud with this. I think that no matter how much my skill improves over time, I will always be able to look at this piece uh, with, with pride and be happy with the work that I put into it. So, Bill, he's my number three. Number two. All right, we've had a fair bit of dioramas, but number two is not a diorama. Although it uh, kind of encompasses a lot of the things that make dioramas great. I'm not gonna pull it all to pieces. This is my Torment build. It was a three-part series that I just recently did. And as far as terrain goes, if I had to, if I was just picking strictly my top terrain, this would be my number one. I enjoyed this set immensely. I had so much fun making it. 
I'm proud of it. To me, it again, crosses that threshold of art. I see no reason that, you know, with a few tweaks, I couldn't just make something like this that could sit in a gallery, a weird gallery, but a gallery nonetheless. It doesn't read just like a toy for, for gaming. It's a set that I think is going to continue to grow. It's something I'm gonna to continue to work on. Torment is my, you know, my little creative baby that I think is gonna stay with me for a long time and I'm gonna build upon and build upon in many different ways. And it was all thanks to this little set that I put together a few weeks ago. I love looking at it. Um, I haven't got to play with it yet. I think it's gonna really be an exciting set of tabletop terrain to, you know, battle on. But I also just love seeing it sitting um, on my on my shelves. I don't keep it back there. I keep it on some shelves over here that I actually face when I'm working because it really motivates and inspires me and it shows me, hey, you, you can do this. Uh, also, this whole set, if you remember from episode one, started from basically a depressive state creative block where I didn't know what to do and I just forced myself to grab some random pieces and start building. And I made the first piece and doing that really kicked my butt into gear, got my motivation, my like excitement flowing, and it turned into this almost month long project that I was really into and just really passionate about. So these pieces serve as that kind of reminder that, you know, you might be feeling terrible, you might be feeling uncreative, unmotivated, things in the world suck, maybe life sucks, your work sucks, whatever, and you might not want to build. But it's really important that no matter how you're feeling, you at least try to unlock that you know inner artist in you that creative spark that you know gives you joy just force your way through it because if you're lucky you'll have a like lightning moment a light bulb will go off and it'll totally turn you around and this set absolutely did that for me so i'm proud of the build but also i love this build on a on a really personal level now number one what is missing? I think you're gonna be surprised. The Vampire. I'm betting very few, if any of you actually guessed this. I have a feeling uh, a lot of you may not have even seen this video because it wasn't you know, a highly ranked, like viewed one in comparison to some of the others. But this little, little diorama or vignette, whatever you wanna call it, I am exceptionally proud of this one. It's not that complicated. Uh, it's small, it's simple, but the form of it, the kind of story it tells in such a small space with just a few pieces, it, I think that it really successfully conveys this image of this count, you know, going down the stairs in his big castle while keeping it very simple and contained. I did a lot of things on it that, you know, I don't normally do with like stairs and curves and stained glass windows. And I think I just have a special place in my heart for the smaller things like this and, you know, my bill. And I can't really explain why, but there's something satisfying about this little tactile piece that isn't this big clunky thing, you know. I just like the green on it. Uh, the green stonework was something I'd never done before. It has that really cool Castle Grayskull vibe. I wish I could explain more why I like this one, but the, the truth is I don't really know. But every time I look at it, I'm happy that I made it and I'm still proud of it. And I love it with every flaw and every mistake. I wouldn't change a thing about it. And I actually haven't really attempted anything similar to this because I'm, I think, concerned that I'll do something similar and it won't be as good. But my little vampire guy, he's my number one. Who guessed it? All right, I'd love to know what build or project you guys are most proud of yourself. So let me know that in the comment section as well. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. Uh, let me know what you thought in the comments. If you wanna pick up some tools or supplies for your hobby needs to make that next project that you're most proud of, check out blackmagiccraft.ca. There I have my essential equipment page that lists and explains all the tools I use to make all this stuff. Uh, you can click on those links, buy it, get the right thing, and support the channel financially while doing your shopping at no extra cost to you. And if you really like these videos that I make, maybe they've unlocked something in you. They've allowed you to you know, experience a new sense of artistic creativity and pride. One way you can really help me keep helping you and people like you is by supporting the channel on Patreon. I'd love to have you as the newest member of the Black Magic Craft Fellowship. That support is absolutely crucial for me fulfilling this you know, lifelong dream of doing what I'm doing. And I wanna keep doing it for as long as I can. So we'll see maybe in another two or three years what my top 10 most 
things, things I'm most proud of are, and if any of these stayed on the list. Cheers, guys. Have a great week.